giving me my tea. Hello, everybody. I don't know if it's happening here. Why isn't that happening yet? Live. There I am. Oh, I forget there's like a crackly noise. I'm so sorry about that crackly noise. There's literally nothing I can do about it. Say hello if you're here. Welcome to uh, React. Hello, Beck. Beck Lou Wes. Uh, welcome to my reaction video to the Women's Prize for non-fiction. So, so much muscle memory in my mouth to say Women's Prize for fiction. Women's Prize for non-fiction. Hello, Divya. Hello, Sarah. Hello, Jojo Bixie. Welcome, welcome. Are we all excited? I mean, I am excited um, because this is a whole new prize, isn't it? It's very, very exciting. On route, on route home from work. Hello, Bethany. Hello, Ellie. Hello, Carton, Manette, Darnie. Need the bus to hurry up. Hurry up, boss. Um, so we are here. Hi, Chris. Definitely excited for this. So we're here at like just gone five to six um at six o'clock this evening if you're wondering what's going on six o'clock this evening there will be an announcement for the first women's prize for non-fiction um long list um it's a list of 16 books um all of which are non-fiction written by women um in the past year so i think if i imagine the same as uh as the Women's Prize for Fiction, um, it needs to run from like probably like the end of March last year, the no, 1st of April this year to the end of March this year. So some of the books that are gonna be announced are probably not even published yet. Um, I am not a massive reader of nonfiction. I've, I've, I'm trying to have like a nonfiction on the go and a fiction on the go at the same time. Um, but here we're going to learn about the books that have been uh, shortlisted, longlisted today. Uh, what will what happen is that when we hit six o'clock, I've got the Women's Prize for Nonfiction uh, page open up um, and then we'll just watch the YouTube video as it goes. I'm not going to be able to listen to it because you guys are here. So I'm just going to be writing down the titles and then we'll go and have a look at the blurbs and see if there are anything I've, I'm interested in. Have I got any predictions? I mean, I've recently read Monsters um, by... <laughs> I've forgotten the name of the author. I imagine that will be on there. Cat someone? Is that who's by? I also think maybe Doppelganger by Naomi Klein will Naomi Klein will be on there. I'm currently reading Eat No, it's not by Cat because this was. I'm currently reading Eve by Cat Bohannon, How the Female Body Drove 200 Million Years of Human Evolution. Um, so I, I don't know if this will be on there, but I'm currently reading this. Um, I think Emperor of Rome by Mary Beard will probably be on there. Um, and then I've just got another one out from the library at the moment, which is eligible, so I thought I'd show that. That's The Dictionary People by Sarah Ogilvy. Um, so yeah, I would be surprised if Monsters wasn't on there. I would be surprised if Emperor of Rome wasn't on there. Um, and I, I imagine Doppelganger will be on there. But yeah, there's 16. And oh, as, it, as is the case, Claire Dederer, thank you. Beconnoisseur. You know how much I love saying Beconnoisseur. Um, yeah, so you know how much, like, <laughs> I haven't done a big prediction. These are the 16 books, I think, just because I'm not educated enough in nonfiction to know. And I don't know what's come out or anything like that. So um, this is going to be a big reveal. But yeah, there's always some sort of, like, stuff that I've never even heard of. There's going to be some smaller presses. Um, there's probably, I haven't included any memoirs here, so there's going to be um, some memoirs and stuff. So, yeah, how it's going to work is that when it comes out, uh, yeah, and also he said getting, it does get me pumped for the, uh, for, the, for the fiction prize as well. So then there'll be a video similar to this um, for the fiction prize where the long list comes out in March, which is very exciting. So we're on the very cusp of six o'clock. Has anybody else got any predictions of things that they think might be on there um, before, before the, the list comes out? Would be very interested. Uh, yeah, Chris says it seems harder to predict non-fiction long list than the fiction one. Absolutely. Like I struggle predicting the fiction one and I feel like I've got my finger on the pulse of um of the fiction and i sort of keep an eye on uh books that have had some hype and stuff and even then when i do the prediction of 16 books some years i've got none <laughs> so uh, so yeah so in order to like i just wouldn't even know i wouldn't have even heard of 16 of the books that have come out so there's definitely going to be some stuff on here that i'm not i'm not aware of so we're just hitting six o'clock now oh it's just gone so that there's 50 seconds left on that. So I'm going to put that on mute. So I am on the women's prize. If you go on the women's prize for nonfiction. Um, there we go. Crypt by Alice Roberts. So I'm on that website that I've just shared in the things. And then I've just put it on mute. Um, and then as it talks through, I'll just be writing the names down. And then we're going to go and discover the titles together, I think. 
Um, Femina by Janina Ramirez. Um, just don't know what the vibe of non-fiction is going to be. Absolutely. I can, I can only assume there'll be some memoirs on there. Hello from the gym. Nothing can keep me from your life. That's good to know. David's cooking me dinner as well, so it's working out perfectly. Um, yeah, I imagine there'll be some non, uh, some, some, uh, oh, here we go. Ten, nine. I imagine there will also be some memoirs on there. Maybe like a graphic memoir. That would be exciting if there was a graphic memoir. And then after all this, we will go, here we go. Long list announcement. It's Professor Susanna Lipscomb. She's familiar to me, but yeah. Um, and then after this, I'm gonna go on the library website and my um, my library apps that I do use to see if I can get some audiobooks for stuff as well. And then, yeah, see if there's anything worse. Well, I'm not, I'm trying, I've only got a limited amount of spending money every month, but we'll, we will see. So there we go. So Susanna was joined by the, the, uh, the it's so exciting that it's a new prize, isn't it? Oh, there it is. Oh, Eve is on there. Right, okay. How are we going to do this? So, All That She Carried by Tia Miles. I'm just going to be writing these downs quickly. Tia Miles. A Flat Pace by Noreen Masood. A Flat Place by Noreen Masood. Intervals. By Marianne Brooker. This is going faster than I can write. Code Dependent by uh, Living in the Shadow of AI by Madhamita Mergia. Code Dependent. The Dictionary People! There we go. That was one. So I had it. The Dictionary People by Sarah O'Gilvy. Shadows by at oh no shadows at noon sorry that front cover was a bit confusing shadows at noon by joy then Eve which I've got I'm already reading that at the moment Cat Bohannon Matrescence which I've not heard of by Lucy Jones oh she's written that wrong sense Thunderclap by Laura Cumming. My hand's running out of steam. I press very hard when I write. Some People Need Killing by Patricia Evangelista. A memoir of murder in the Philippines. Oh, Jesus. The Britannia's An Island Quest by Alice Albinia. How to Say Babylon, I've got a reservation on that at the library at the moment, my hand, by Safia Sinclair. Wifedom by Anna Thunder. Thunder spelt like thunder, but spelt thunder. Oh, and. Oh, Doppelganger by Naomi Klein. So, my, my tiny little predictions have come off all right. Three out of four so far. And how many have we got so far? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen. We've got two more to come. Vulture Capitalism by Grace Blakely. And Young Queens. Oh, Mary Beard wasn't on there. By Leah Redmond Chang. Oh, that Young Queens looks right up my bloody street. Okay, so there we go. I'm going to cancel that now and we'll come back to us. Hello. Oh, Deborah's excited about Thunderclap. Oh, I've got a whole library hold on Wifedom. Right. Okay. So we're going to run through the 16 books and then we're going to find out a little bit more about them. I can get rid of everything. I can't believe that wasn't 
long list is. I can't really put money on that. Right, okay, so we've got All That She Carried by Tia Miles, A Flat Place by Noreen Masood, Intervals by Marianne Brooker, Code Dependent, I get to the point where I haven't got authors here, but we will go through them again. This is me just re reading the list. The Dictionary People by Sarah Gilvey, Shadows at Noon, Eve by Kat Bohannon, uh, Matricense by Lucy Jones, Thunderclap by Laura Cummin, Some People Need Killing by Patricia, I didn't get the surname of that, The Britannia's An Island Quest, How to Say Babylon, Wifedom by Anna Thunder, Doppelganger by Naomi Klein, Vulture Capitalism, and Young Queens by Leah Redmond Chang. So that's exciting. So out of the four that I had, um, Monsters wasn't on there though, that's surprising. So yeah, three, I've got three here, ready and waiting. That's always gets me very excited. So the ones I've heard of, apart from that, um, I've heard of How to Say Babylon, as I said, I've got a, a, a reservation on the library about that. And I think I've heard of Some People Need Killing, um, but the rest I haven't heard of. So should we go through and learn a little bit about them? Has anybody got anything that they're cute? So we've got here, Deborah's excited about Thunderclap. Beth says, I've got a library hold on Wifedom. Uh, Carton says, uh, Carton Man at Darnie says, I've heard of Wifedom and that's it. All of, and, and Thunderclap. Young Queen sounds really good, says Books and Tea with Chloe. Yeah, I've got, that sounds right up my bloody straza, the older, the Young Queens. Right, so let's start with the top of the list. So we'll start with... Um, all that she carried. My library is going to take a, a bashing. I mean, I'm, I'm, there we go. Oh, it's out in paperback as well, which is nice. Is it? Yeah, it's out in paperback. Right, okay. So all that she carried by Tia Miles. Um, also uh, long listed for the Bailey Gifford Prize. So in 1850s South Carolina, Rose, an enslaved woman, faced a crisis, the imminent sale of her daughter Ashley. Thinking quickly, she packed a cotton bag with a few items. Soon after, the nine-year-old girl was separated from her mother and sold. Decades later, Ashley's granddaughter Ruth embroidered this family history on the sack in spare haunting language. That in itself is a story, but it's not the whole story. How does one uncover the lives of people who, in their day, were considered property? Harvard historian Tia Miles carefully traces these women's faint present in archival records and where archives fall, fall short, she turns to objects, art and the environment to write a singular history of the experience of slavery and the uncertain freedom afterwards. All that she carried gives us history as it was lived, a poignant story of resilience and love passed down against steep odds. Well, sounds great, doesn't it? Absolutely amazing. So let's have a look. So thoughts on... All that she carried. Who who thinks they'll be reading all that she carried? Um, have, have, has anyone read it here? What are your thoughts on it? Um, we've got Ariane saying Shadows at Noon is a real chunkster. I saw it at a bookstore recently. Carson says straight onto the library website for me. Shadow at Noon looks huge. I only heard of How to Say Babylon and Doppelganger. I have a library reservation on both. So, what? So based on what I've just said about all that she carried by Tia Moore Miles. Sorry. Uh, what do people think? I'm going on my library app now <laughs> so that I can put a reservation on it. I've got two libraries. The only th other thing is if any of them are on audiobook, but we don't need to concern ourselves with that quite yet. Uh, go on the Kent libraries. So anyone think that they'd be keen to read All That She Carried by Tia Miles? So we've got Angela saying it sounds amazing. Catherine says, I think I read that in 2022. Well, the paperback is coming out on the 1st of February, has come out literally just now, the 1st of February. Let's have a look and see when it was published here. Because that would be interesting. Just logging into the old library accounts. Um, and then the hardback came out on the 13th of July, 2023. So unless you're in another country to us, uh, to, to the UK, maybe it was there, but let's have a look. All that she carried. The journey of Ashley Sack, a black family. There we go. Reservation on. I'm the first person there. That's what I like to see. Hopefully I won't run out of reservations this time. Great, right, okay, well, let's, should we move on to the next one then? Oh, here we go. Ariane Fowler says, yes, I read all that she carried two years ago. Quite good. Oh, yeah, maybe all that she carried was released in the US in 2021. Right, so that might be a new rule. I don't know how that works with uh, the Fiction Prize, but maybe it's the UK, um, the UK dates. But yeah, reservation put on, looking forward to it. Right, the next one is called A Flat Place by Noreen Masood. Has anybody heard of A Flat Place? by Noreen Masood. I have not heard of this. 
Um, this was published on the 27th of um, April last year. Looks like it's only out in hardback. Um, it says here, raw and radical, strange and beguiling, a love letter to Britain's breathtaking flatlands from Orford Ness to Orkney and a reckoning with the painful hidden histories they contain. Noreen Masood has always loved flatlands. Her earliest memory is of a wide flat field glimpsed from the back seat of her father's car in Lahore. As an adult in Britain, she has discovered many more flat landscapes in love, Orford Ness, the Cambridgeshire Fens, Morecambe Bay, Orkney. These bare haunted expanses remind her of the flat place inside herself, the place created by trauma. Noreen suffers from a complex post-traumatic stress disorder, the product of a profoundly disrupted and unstable childhood. It flattens her emotions, blanks out parts of her memory and colours her world with anxiety. Undertaking a pilgrimage around Britain's flatlands, seeking solace and belonging, she weaves her impressions of the natural world with poetry, folklore and history and with recollections of her own early life. Noreen's British Pakistani heritage makes her a partial outsider in these landscapes, both coloniser and colonised, inheritor and dispossessed. Here violence lies be beneath the fantasy of pastoral innocence and histories of harm are interwoven with nature's power to heal. Here, as in her own family history, are many stories that resist the telling. She pursues these paradoxes fearlessly across the flat, haunted spaces she loves, offering a startlingly strange, vivid and intimate account of the land beneath her feet. Well, there we go. So that is A Flat Place by Noreen Masood. Um, came out last April, only out a apparently in hardback has anybody read uh, a flat place she goes straight onto the old library app a flat place came out last year i i mean it sounds very very powerful and interesting no the flat shares come up on there so that's that's one library let's go into the next one i don't know if it sounds a bit of a, it sounds like a hard read doesn't it which sometimes not I can't always do hard read. So it is available for my second library. Two copies, one reserve. I'm going to put a little query on that one because I might see if they, it's out in audio, but I haven't. So that is available from one of my libraries. So there we go. Has anybody read A Flat Place? Heard of A Flat Place? Interested in reading A Flat Place? Let's find out. These boots are made for dancing. Thanks for coming along, by the way, guys, for... There's 126 of us all just having a little chat about a long list. I missed doing this last year. Sadly, when it was the uh, Women's Prize uh, for Fiction long list, David's dad had quite selfishly just had a cardiac arrest. So I was unable to do the. He's fine now. Um, very well, in fact. Um, so I wasn't able to do that. Right, okay. So it doesn't look as though anyone, anyone has said that they have read A Flat Place or heard of A Flat Place. Um, if anyone's interested in reading it, do let me know. Um, I am on the fence with this one. I think all that she carried, I've put a reservation on that. Uh, a flat place, it sounds, I mean, I, I think there's going to be a lot of heavy stuff. Hey, look at Debbie. She's that where Minnie used to sit. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of heavy stuff here. But yeah, I don't, I've, I've put a little question mark on that. I might put a reservation on it. Here we go. Angelaide says, I have heard of it, but it doesn't sound like my cup of tea. Uh, Chris says, never heard of a flat place, but it sounds so, it uh, sounds good. So I ordered it. Great. Catherine has said, yes, I got the US version, but I think that might have been of all that she carried. Right. Okay. Should we move on to the next one then? So the next one is called Intervals by Marianne Brooker. Marianne Brooker. Not heard of this one either. Oh, there's some more stuff here about a uh, flat place. So Jenny has said, I love reading books about CPTSD, so I may well read it. Great. And Jojo Binksy said, never heard of it, but it sounds interesting. I'm not a fan of Flatlands, so would be intrigued to see how it fits in the story. So Intervals by Marianne Brooker. Uh, this is published by Fitzeraldo. Those beautiful little things. Oh, it's not even published yet. Uh, it's coming out on the 28th of February. So let's have a little read about this. So it says, what makes a good death a good daughter? In 2009, with her 40s and a harsh wave of austerity on the horizon, Marianne Brooker's mother was diagnosed with primary progressive multiple sclerosis. She made a workshop of herself and her surroundings, combining creativity and activism in inventive ways. But over time, her ability to walk, to move and to live without pain diminished drastically. Determined to die in her own home on her own terms, she stopped eating and drinking in 2019. 
In intervals, Brooke, Brooke Adil reckons with heartbreak, weaving her first and final memories with the study of doulas, living wills, and the precarious economics of social hospice and funeral care. Blending memoir, polemic, and feminist philosophy, Brooke joins writers such as Anne Boyer, Maggie Nelson, Donald Winnicott, and Lola Olafemi to raise essential questions about choice and interdependence, and ultimately, to imagine care otherwise. Right, so this sounds very moving and important. I think the, the whole thought, like, Eventually, I imagine any of us that live to a certain age are going to require a level of care and also I think would, would like to grasp the dignity, um, as much dignity as you can in your end of life times. Um, I had a grandmother that um, died in hospital um, and I think she would have really liked to have died at home. Um, so I think it's very important. What, what, what worries me here in terms of whether or not I'm going to like it is blending uh, philosophy with stuff. Um, so yeah, I don't know how much this is for me. I don't feel like maybe I would read it. Let me see if it's available at my library. Hello, my love. You all right? For me? Yes. Yes. Uh, He's making dinner. Warm. So it's not available at, um, my, either of my libraries, maybe because... Yeah, it's not it's not available either of my library. So even if I wanted to read it. <laughs> so what do people think about Intervals by Marianne Brooker? I don't think I'm going to get my mitts on that. If it gets shortlisted, then may well have a look at it. But let's have a look. Uh, Jenny says, I've read so many hard reads that my friends and I have a meme of hashtag cheery beach reads only after I read the bell jar on a beach in Italy. That sounds very good. But yeah, what do people think about Intervals by Marianne Brooker? Is anybody keen to read that? Um, as I said, it isn't out yet. So unless um, you may well have read a proof copy or something, I don't know if anybody's read it. But let's move on to the next one, which is called Code Dependent by Madamita Mergia. This hasn't come out yet either. So this is out um, on the 28th. I'm just going to see if anybody else had anything more to say about Intervals. So Ariane says, I'm not sure about Intervals. If we move on to the next one, which is Codependent, Living in the Shadow of AI by Madhumita Mergia. This isn't out until the 28th of March. Um, it says, a timely... Oh, here we go. What does it mean to be human in a world that is rapidly changing thanks to the development of artificial intelligence, of automated decision-making that both draws on and influences our behaviour? Through the voices of ordinary people in places far removed from Silicon Valley, Codependent explores the impact of a set of powerful, flawed and often exploitative technologies on individuals, communities and our wider society. Madame Mika AI editor at the Financial Times, exposes how AI can strip away our collective and individual sense of agency and shatter our illusion of free will. AI is already changing what it means to be human in ways large and small. In this compelling work, Mergia reveals what could happen if we fail to reclaim our humanity. Published by Pam Macmillan, lovely. Right, I am going to put a reservation on that. That sounds bloody great. It's not out yet, um, so it may well not be at either of my libraries, um, but we'll have a look. What do people think about Code Dependent by Madhu, uh, sorry, Madhumita Mergia? What do people think about Code Dependent? It's a good title as well, isn't it? Code Dependent. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, Chris says Intervals was on NetGalley but didn't read it. Uh, Carter Manet Dan uh, Danny says Sounds interesting but also like it's going to make me cry, which isn't that difficult to be fair. I think we're talking about um, Intervals with that one. Uh, Rosie said I've heard of Flat Pace because I read a lot of nature and travel nonfiction. Pam says Definitely interested in this one, fascinated by AI. Jojo Binksy says, I haven't heard of Codependent, Codependent, but I'd really like to read that one. Very interested in AI and how it's appearing without understanding the impact. Yeah, I feel I'm going to put a reservation on it. Two copies, no reservation. Oh, well, it's not out yet. That's why. But I'll probably be top of the queue then. There we go. I have to, but I've got two libraries. Some I have to, one I have to pay a pound for for reservations. I'm happy to do it. Um, but I always check the, the freebie one first. Right, there we go. So put a reservation on Codependent. Um, there we go. So that's two out of the four I've put reservations on. A flat place I'm still thinking about uh we've also got uh carter manette darnie saying uh 10 out of 10 for the title and jojo binksy agreeing saying very good isn't it so there we go codependent i feel excited about um the next one is one that i if i'm if i'm allowed to say i um i predicted it i i mean i had four books here that i thought maybe could make it but there were just four books that i had so the next one is the dictionary people the unsung heroes who created the oxford english dictionary by sarah or so i mean i'm sure we've all used a dictionary at some point this is 
here we go, let's go. The Oxford English Dictionary has been has long been associated with elite institutions and Victorian men. Its longest serving editor, James Murray, devoted 36 years to the project as far as the letter T. But the dictionary didn't just belong to the experts, it relied on contributions from members of the public. By the time it was finished in 1928, its 414,825 entries had been crowdsourced from a surprising and diverse group of people, from archaeologists and astronomers to murderers, naturists, novelists, pornographers, queer couples, suffragists, vicars and vegetarians. Lexographer, lexicographer Sarah Ogilvy, who I think might have written a fiction book. Maybe I'm thinking of the wrong person. Uh, Sarah Ogilvy dives deep into previously untapped archives to tell a, tell a people's history of the Oxford English Dictionary. She traces the lives of thousands of contributors who define the English language from the eccentric autodictats to the family groups who made the word collective their passion. Word collection, their passion. With generosity and brio, Gilby reveals for the first time the full story of the making of one of the most famous books in the world and celebrates to a sparkling effect the extraordinary efforts of the dictionary people. Well, I've got it. I'll probably start it. May well start this on my Friday reading blog tomorrow. I mean, I've got, I've, I'm already reading this one, but I mentioned I'm, in the old Friday reading blogs, I do like to um, start new books every time, so it's a bit fresh. So I started this last, I haven't got very far with it. But yeah, I'm a slow reader of non fiction, but maybe I'll start this. So there we go. Uh, Annika says I would be interested in code dependent my library doesn't have it ordered yet but Annika has just put a reservation on the dictionary people just because I've got it here should we read the first just to get a feel for it I know it's the introduction but let's get a feel for the first few lines just to see if it just if I can help you a little bit to see if there's anything we would we would um, like together so introduction discovering the dictionary people it was in a hidden corner of the Oxford University press basement where the dictionary's archive is stored that I opened a dusty box and come across a small black book tied with a cream ribbon. That basement archive is, strangely perhaps, one of my favourite places in the world. Silent, cold, musty smelling, rows of movable steel shelves on rollers, brown acid-free boxes bulging with letters, millions of paper, millions of slips of paper tied in bundles with twine and dictionary proofs covered in small, precise handwriting. It is a place full of friendly, word nerd ghosts. I mean, yeah, it sounds readable, doesn't it? It sounds, yeah, it sounds good. Because I've got it here. It's quite, it's about 350 pages long. Yeah, 350 pages long. Yeah, sounds, I, I will, I will go for it. I've already got it. It's got, I've got a little tick on it. So that's three out of the five so far. Uh, Jane, Books of Jane says, I like this. Beth saying, Beth put a reservation on it as well. Sounds good. Cool, cool, cool. Right, okay. So that's The Dictionary People by Sarah Ogilvy. God, I've just realised it's 20 past six. I'm going to have to speed up, guys. Otherwise, I'm going to be leaving David to not to eat dinner on his own. Right, Shadows um, Shadows at Noon. Is this the one that people said was massive? By Joya Chatterjee. Uh, this came out in... Is This is in hardback. It came out on the 13th of July last year. Um, and it says, uh, Shadows at Noon, the South Asian 20th century. Um, based on the decades of scholarship, this is the authoritative history of South Asia in the 20th century. Shadows at Noon tells the subcontinent story. This is why it's so big, I imagine. Shadows at Noon tells the subcontinent story from the British Raj through independence and partition to the forging of the modern nations of India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Unlike other histories of the region, which concentrate exclusively on politics, she's got me, here food, leisure and the household are given as much importance as na uh, nationhood, migration and the state. Thematic rather than chronological, love that. Each chapter illuminates an overarching topic that has shaped South Asia. This format enables us to explore issues like the changing character of the family or the Indian diet over time and in depth. Chatterjee's purpose is to make contemporary South Asia, its cultural vibrancy, diversity, social structures and political makeup intelligible to everyone. In so great in so in so doing this bold innovative and personal work rallies against standard narratives of inherent differences between india pakistan and bangladesh and reveals the many things people have in common well saying how much how readable it is that's got me going for it so shadow shadows at noon i, I wonder though do i try and get it on audio because if it's big they have got it at my library right she'll put a reservation on it anyway but if it's big, it might be one that maybe I dip in and out of the audio and the book. I've got so much reading to do these next few weeks, haven't I? Um, but yeah, the, the focus on it being readable and the fact that it's a history of 
some nations told in the thematic way rather than chronological because chronological sometimes I'm like I just want to get to this bit but thematically that means I'm going to be well into the, the chapter about food I'm going to be well into the chapter about family already it feels like it's more digestible for me digestible like food so it sounds great um okay so <laughs> Chris is just oh here we go um Catherine also interested in the dictionary people. Lucy said, I've just read the dictionary of lost words. Very excited to read the dictionary people. Chris has said 864 pages. <whistles> Jeez, it's the demon cophead of the non-fiction list. I would say so too. But yeah, maybe that flip in between the book and the, the audio. I've put a reservation on the book, so let's see. Uh, Jojo Binksy says, that sounds like a huge amount of history to fit in one book, doesn't it? Absolutely. Pam says, I might actually buy Shadows at Noon. This sounds like my kind of non-fiction. Yeah, I feel like the, the, the there's definitely a firm focus on it being readable which I'm very up for um Annika says 100% I want to read shadows I'm of South Asian heritage but live in the UK and don't know any of the history oh my god Annika that sounds amazing doesn't it uh Catherine says this sounds amazing and Ariana says uh I really want to Ariane sorry it said I really want to read shadows at noon well there we go so two four six and I've put reservations on four so yeah pretty good right the next one is Eve by Kat Bohannon, which is one that I'm reading at the moment. I say reading, God, my dinner smells so good. I'm 24 pages in, so I've just, I've only just done the introduction. I feel like you can't get all that much from the introduction. The next chapter starts with, it's called Milk. Um, so it's all about, maybe it will, I'll read like a few lines of that to see how we get on. But this is the blurb of Eve. The myth-busting, eye-opening history of who we really are and why. How did wet nurses drive civilization? Are women always the weaker sex? Is sexism useful for evolution? And are our bodies at war with our babies? In Eve, Kat Bohannon answers questions scientists should have been addressing for decades. With boundless curiosity and sharp wit, she covers the past 200 million years to explain the specific science between, behind the development of the female sex. Eve is not only a sweeping revision of human history, it's an urgent and necessary corrective for a world that has focused primarily on the male body for far too long. But Hannon's finding, including everything from the way C-sections in the industrialised world are rearranging women's pelvic shape to the surprising similarities between pus and breast milk, will completely change what you think you know about evolution. So yeah, I've read the first, uh, the, the, the introduction of this. I can't say it swept me up. Um, and yeah, maybe like in, in the way that I've just read the first few lines of the dictionary people, I was like, oh yeah, that sounds like I could read it. This feels less, I mean... It's still got a bit of cheekiness. It opens with talking about um, the the, the, the C-section scene in Prometheus, uh, which is a film by Ridley Scott. So that got me go that got me into it, and then it sort of lost me a little bit. Uh, but let's let's read. Oh God, I can't stop thinking how nice my dinner smells. I've got butter bean burgers for dinner. So the first chapter is called Chapter One Milk. Uh, it's got a little picture of a little mouse or a rat breastfeeding some little baby mice or rats. So let's go. So milk. There in the soft grass, in the wet crush of evening, she was waiting. Furred body sheared with drops of rain, no bigger than a human thumb. We call her Morgie, little hunter, one of the first eaves. She waited at the mouth of her burrow because the sky was still pale. Streaky threads of photons refracting through clouds, the deepening blue beyond. That's milk. So there we go. Uh, Pam says want to read Eve. So I am currently reading Eve. This is also one I was thinking maybe I would get on better with this through audio. Um, a few people have let me know and it's been very useful that you get 15 hours of free audiobooks through um Aud no not audible because i've given up on audible what am i thinking of spotify um so i was going to use that as a sort of like mop up so if i don't get to finish this then i can go to um spotify and 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 finish it using the audio stuff but um yeah this is one because it isn't available on either of my audiobooks i've got two library apps where i listen to audiobooks it's not available on either of those but yeah i haven't um I haven't loved it so far, but we, we shall see. We shall see. Emily says, keen to give this a go. And it looks like my library has a copy. Great. Yeah, that might be one that is more available. It was published last year. Pam says, the start of that has me hooked, but I enjoyed you reading it. So maybe audio is how I should do it. Yeah, I sometimes feel like I am an audio girl when it comes to um, nonfiction. Um, but yeah, so that's another one then that I've got. Uh, so we got, so out of seven so far, I've, I've put reservations on, or already have five. So going quite well. Um, Annika says, who's the author of Eve? So I can look it up. It's Kat Bohannon. Uh, Bohannon, so Kat is like 
meow, that dappy, uh, Bohannon is B-O-H-A-N-N-O-N. Uh, Jojo Pinksy says, I'm not sold on Eve yet. I nearly bought it in the Waterstone sale, but it didn't grab me. And Chantal says, just put Eve on hold through my library and it's on a nine week wait. So I'll look forward to it. Nice. Sometimes it's nice to space out these uh, waits though, because I like when I had all of them coming in, I mean, look, this is all that I've in here. <laughs> um, it's nice to have them spaced out a bit. Uh, there we go. Right. Okay. So should we move on to the next one, which is Matrosense? I think by Lucy Jones, but I didn't get the name down. Matrosense. By Lucy Jones? No, that's not even coming up. Let's search Lucy Jones. Um, it might not have been Lucy Jones. Have I got it right? Mat oh, I spent it, I spelt it wrong. It's Ma Matrosense by Lucy Jones. So Oh, Lucy Jones has also written a nice book that looks about that looks that it's on uh, about foxes. Right, so it's only out in hardback at the moment. Um, it came out on the 26th, uh, 22nd of June last year. Matrosens on the metamorphosis of pregnancy, childhood and motherhood. Childbirth and motherhood. Um, a radical new examination of the transition into motherhood and how it affects the mind, brain and body. During pregnancy, childbirth and early motherhood, women undergo a far-reaching physiological, psychological and social metamorphosis. There is no other time in a human's life course that entails such dramatic change other than adolescence. And yet this life altering transition has been sorely neglected by science, medicine and philosophy. Its seismic effects go largely represented across literature and the arts. Speaking about motherhood as anything other than a pastel hued dream remains for the most part taboo. In this groundbreaking, deeply personal investigation, acclaimed journalist and author Lucy Jones brings to light the emerging concept of matrosense. Matrosense? I don't know if I'm saying that right. Drawing on a new research across various fields, neuroscience and evolutionary biology, psychoanalysis and existential therapy, sociology, economics and ecology, lots of ologies, Jones shows how the changes in the maternal mind, brain and body are far more profound, wild and enduring than we have been led to believe. She reveals the dangerous consequences of our neglect of the maternal experience and interrogates the patriarchal and capitalist systems that have created the untenable situations mothers face today. Here is an urgent examination of the modern institution of motherhood, which seeks to unshackle all parents from oppressive social norms as it deepens our understandings of mater sense i think it is it raises vital questions about motherhood and femininity interdependence and individual identity as well as our relationships with each other and the living world i think this is going to be very very um popular um as books on motherhood ordinarily are not with myself though i um oh, i suppose i am a mother to my cat daphne um but i don't want to be a mother not to her <laughs> i don't want to have, david and i don't want kids um so uh books about motherhood um are always not really on my radar which in some ways should be something why i should read this because i come from a mother i know many mothers um and i imagine this is interesting but i don't think it's for me so um i won't be putting a reservation on this one but that is made to sense by lucy jones thank you alison for writing it in there um and yeah, so that's that's the next one. So that that's one that I won't be. So I'm going to say no. Put a no on that one. But yeah, what do you guys think? Has anyone read it? Anyone keen to read it? David, that dinner smells amazing. Good. Doesn't it though? I feel like I've, I'm a bit full of cake. My sister just brought around some cake and I feel a bit full of cake. Right. Okay, so two, four, six, eight. We're halfway through. Two, four, six, eight. We're halfway through. Uh, so let's go on to Thunderclap by Laura Cumming. Quite a few of you had heard of Thunderclap. I had not. Um, so let's find out what it's about. It is out in hardback. It came out uh, in July last year. Um, and Laura Cumming has also written a book called Chapel Sands. Thunderclap, a memoir of art and life and sudden death. On the morning of the 12th of October, 1654, in the Dutch city of Delft, a sudden explosion was followed by a thunderclap that could be heard more than 70 miles away. Carol Fribitius, now known across the world for his exquisite painting, the Goldfinch, had been at work in his studio. He, along with many others, would not survive the day. In Thunderclap, Laura Cumming reveals her passion for the art of the Dutch Golden Age and her determination to lift up the repu reputation of Fabricius. Fabricius. She reveals the Netherlands were wandering where she reveals the Netherlands where wandering the narrow streets of Amsterdam, driving across the flatlands or pausing at a quiet waterfront. Second mention of flatlands tonight. She encounters the rich reality behind the shining beauty of Vermeer and Rembrandt, Howes and De Hooch. 
She shares, too, her relationship with her father, the Scottish artist James Cumming, who had his own deep connection to Dutch painting and who taught her about colour, light and the rewards of looking deeply. This is a book about what a picture may come to mean, how it can enter your life and change your thinking in a thunderclap, a sudden clarity of sight. There is also a book about the precariousness of human life, the way it may be snatched from us in an instant. What can art do to sustain us? The work that survives tells us its own compelling story in these pages. So this is when things get, this is when nonfiction gets sort of, uh, for me, unaccessible. When something's about something quite specific that I previously hadn't even thought about and potentially don't have all that much interested in, interest in, uh, this is one that I probably won't be bothering with. Although there was quite a few people that were excited to hear that Thunderclap was on it. So maybe it is more readable than I thought. But yeah, I'm not really into art. So reading about like art from people I don't know from an area I don't, I've not got any links to. Yeah, it doesn't feel like it's for me. But like I said, quite a few people were excited, um, were, were into it. Um, so yeah, I mean, let me know what you think. Um, if you are planning on reading Thunderclap by Lucy Cumming, uh, Laura Cumming, sorry, but I will not be. Right, okay, so Pat, so just a few more thoughts about um, Matricense, which I still haven't worked out how to say. Matricense, Matricense, Matricense. Pam says, I don't think I'll read this. I can't have kids anyway, though I know I could still read it, lol. And Jojo thinks he's saying the same for me. So a few people not that bothered about Matricense. Angela says, I'm Dutch and I like the words of Vermeer, etc. But I tend not to like books about someone's thoughts about art. Yeah, I think I think I feel the same as well. What's the tea? Emma says, art not for me either. Pam says, thunderclap, I can't decide. This could go either way for me. Jojo Binksy says, I like the idea of thunderclap, but it feels like it's been on my shelf unread for the next 10 years. And Alison Piazza says, another cat mum here. Sounds an interesting, but a pass. Okay, that's still about mate, mater sense. Um, so yeah, so not so thunderclap not for me either. So we seem to we've got two back to back, which I haven't been that interested in. So mater sense and thunderclap. The next one is some people need kids. So keep keep telling me. Oh, matrescence. This is Natalie. Matrescence. Am I saying it right? I'm so bad at pronunciation. Annika says, Thunderclap, not for me. I like looking at art, but not necessarily learning about the artist. Yeah, it's making me think about... Annika, what was that book we read for Patreon Book Club? About Chopin. And I thought, oh, I'm not going to like that at all. And then I did. I got rid of the book because I, I liked it, but I didn't, I didn't love it. I can't think what it's called. But yeah, like, maybe, I mean, maybe I would enjoy it, but I just feel like... No, it's going into a non-fiction book, briefly a delicious life. Thank you, Barbara. Um, going into a, a, a non-fiction book about a topic that I've got no interest in and I feel a bit like, I don't think I'm going to like this. That's not a way to approach a non-fiction book, so I just shan't bother. Uh, Natalie says, more mat than mate. So matrescence, 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 matrescence. There you go. Uh, Buconnoisseur says, I'm an artist, so I'm planning to read it. I'll let everyone know how readable it is. Please do, Buconnoisseur. And both Barbara and Annika have said briefly a delicious life. Yeah, maybe I've got vibes of that, but I don't know. Right, the next one is Some People Need Killing. Um, and this one I've heard about. I don't know where I've heard about it from. Some people uh, need killing. And this one I feel like I would be... Oh, it's, oh it is on there. Uh, okay, so this came out on the 2nd of November by Patricia Evangelista. Uh, it's a memoir of murder in the Philippines. Um, and here we go. So it says, my job is to go to people where... Pla Let's start again. My job is to go to places where people die. I pack my bags, talk to the survivors, write my stories, then I go home to wait for the next catastrophe. I don't wait very long. Journalist Patricia Evangelista come of age, came of age in the aftermath of a street revolution that forged a new future for the Philippines. Three decades later, in the face of mounting inequality, the nation discovered the fragility of its democratic institutions under the regime of strongman Rodrigo Duterte. Heard. Some People Need Killing is Evangelista's meticulously reported and deeply human chronicle on the Philippines drug war. For six years, Evangelista's chronicled the killings carried out by police and vigilantes in the name of Duterte's war, Duterte's war on drugs, a war that has led to the slaughter of thousands, immersing herself in the world of killers and survivors and capturing the atmosphere of fear created where an elected president decides that some lives are worth less than others. The book takes its title from a vigilante whose words seem to reflect the psychological accommodation that most of the country had made. I'm really not a bad guy, he says. I'm not at all bad. Some people need killing. A profound act of witness and a tour de force of literary journalism, Some People Need Killing, is also a brilliant dissection of the grammar of violence and an important investigation of the human impulses to dominate and resist. Right, okay. 
I'm in two minds about this because it sounds, I, I know nothing about the modern Philippines, let alone the history of the Philippines and the war on drugs in Philippines. And I think it sounds interesting, again, saying that something's a deeply hu human chronicle and saying that something is a tour de force of literary journalism. They've got me interested. But this is going to be hugely violent. Um, and I don't always love to read violent books. Sometimes you need a break from that. So I'm not, I'm, I'm just going to see if it's at my library. It's not at one library. Let's try the other one. It's not at either. Okay, so that sort of maybe answers it for me then. It's not at either of my libraries. That session's timed out because it's been so long since I've been on there. Um, but yeah, it's not. Oh no, it's no. So it's not at either of my things. I don't, yeah, I think, yeah, for me, I, I'm going to say, I'm going to put a line next to it. So it's not a cross, it's a line, but I don't think I shall be reading it. Alison Piazza says, some people, not my thing. Nonfiction is so personal, I fear, no matter how well written. If you're not hugely interested, you're just not interested. Jojo Binksy says, that sounds really interesting. I know an embarrassingly small amount of, about the Philippines, me too. Pam says, the only reason I know anything about this topic is because of the character in the sitcom Superstar, uh, Superstore. Barbara says, I put a reservation on Thunderclap, we will see. So yeah, so I think I'm going to leave Some People Need Killing um, by Patricia Evangelista. Yeah, I'm torn on it and it might be one that I go back to. Okay, the next one is The Britannias, An Island Quest. I'm going to have to speed this up because I also really need the toilet. Oh. Can't find it. The Britannias. I can't find it at all. Let's search an island quest. I mean, I may well be spending spelling Britannia's wrong. The Britannia's. Oh, I don't think I was spelling it wrong, but here we go. Uh, this came out last October by Alice Albinia. Uh, it's it. Oh, I love stuff set in an uh, set on an island. So it's the Britannia's an archipelago's tale, and I love the word archipelago. The Britannias tells the story of Britain's islands and how they are woven into its collective cultural psyche. From Neolithic Orkney to modern day Thanet, Alice Albinia explores the furthest reach of Britain's island topography, once known, wrote Pliny, by the collective term Britannia. Sailing over borders between languages and genres, trespassing through the, the past to understand the present, this book knocks the centre out to foreground neglected epics and subversive voices. The ancient British mythology of islands ruled by women runs like a secret, hidden river through the literature of this land. From Roman colonial era reports to early Welsh poetry, Renaissance drama to restoration utopias, transcending and subverting the most male fixated of ages, the Britannias looks far back into the past for direction and solace, while searching for new meaning about Br women's status in the body politic. Boldly upturning established truths about Britain, it pays homage to the island's beauty, independence and their suppressed or forgotten histories. What do you think about that, David? Not my pretty. You weren't really listening. I wasn't. But you're waiting for me. How many books are you used to waiting for? No, we've got them all. We're just going through them. Oh, okay. So we've got five more to do. Is it ready? Well, in about three, four minutes. Oh, okay. Right. Okay, guys, so the Britannias I'm going to get, I love stuff on island, uh, on islands. Let's see if it's available in any of my libraries. It's not. There we go. The Britannias and Island Quest, it's at one of these libraries. No, so I'm going to get it. Six copies, three reserves. It's going to be a while. It's going to be a while. She's trying to place a reservation. So that's that. So what are people saying about it? Um, Hannah says, go to the loo if you need to. <laughs> Thank you. Alison says, I didn't understand any of that. Maybe I'm tired. Angulators, that sounds good. 
Uh, Pam says, yes, I'm interested in this. Uh, Scotland alone is over 700 hours. Uh, what's the TM? It says, I was hoping for something to do with disability rights. Yeah, I mean, we haven't got to the end of the list yet, so I assume that means there's nothing on there about that, which is a shame. Poor David, he must be starving, waiting for Lauren to finish. Also, 512 pages long. Quite a few chunky old books on the list, aren't there? Yeah, I always expected it. Right, so what we're going to do, because I do desperately need the toilet and David's making me dinner. Um, there's five more, but I'm going to leave them and then I'm going to talk about them in my Friday reading vlog tomorrow. So there's five more to discuss. So uh, How to Say Babylon, Wifedom, Doppelganger, Vulture cult, cult, uh, Capitalism and Young Queens. They will all be spoken about in the Friday reading vlog, um, which I will film tomorrow. So apologies. I can't come back after dinner, Hannah. Sorry, I'm going to the cinema. Um, so so we're going to wrap this up now. This took a lot longer than I, liked, uh, than I liked than I thought it would, but I very much enjoyed it. So thank you very much for... Um, for, for being here for the, for the, how many did we discuss? Two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven. Um, but yeah, we're going to do the other five in the, in the Friday reading vlog. So we'll talk about them then. So thank you very much. Um, get putting those reservations on and I'll see you in the comments of uh, the next Friday reading vlog that will have more about the last five books. Goodbye. Dinner time. Bye.